भोगी लाल लहरचंद इंस्टीट्यूट की तरफ से जैन पेंटिंग्स पर द्वितीय व्याख्यान माला में आप सबका हार्दिक स्वागत है आपने देखा पिछले वर्ष हम लोगों ने डॉक्टर पवन जी के द्वारा भारतीय मंदिर एवं वास्तुकला का कितना सूक्ष्म और इनके द्वारा जो प्रस्तुत चित्र थे वो बहुत वर्ष हम लोग जैन पेंटिंग्स पर विशेष करके उनके व्याख्यान की श्रृंखला को सुन रहे हैं तो कल पिछले सप्ताह में हम लोगों ने मेरी आवाज आ रही है मैडम आपके पास आप लोगों के पास हेलो जी सर आपकी ध्वनि सुनाई दे रही है हाँ हाँ जी जी तो आज के इस व्याख्यान माला में आप लोगों का स्वागत करते हुए जैसा कि पिछली बार मैडम ने इंट्रोडक्शन भूमिका के रूप में एक विस्तार से जैन पेंटिंग्स के महत्व का प्रतिपादन किया था जिसमें क्या क्या विषय वस्तु समावेश हो सकती है और है उसका पूरा एक चित्रण हमारे सामने उपस्थित किया था सिद्ध प्रतिमाओं का फ्लैग का स्वास्तिक का फिर इसके बाद अष्टमंगल के अष्टमंगल का विस्तार से प्रतिपादन किया था और कैसे कैसे जैन भंडारों में हमारे चित्र हैं उन सब का प्रतिपादन किया था आज हम देखेंगे कि कैसे हमारे कल्प सूत्र में और इस तरह के जो काल का चार कथा है उत्तराध्यन सूत्र है आदि पुराण है भक्तांबर स्तोत्र है उपदेश माला है या सुधर चरित है शांतिनाथ चरित है और संग्रहणी सूत्र है तो इन सब ग्रंथों के आधार पर आज मैडम विशिष्ट चित्रकला का प्रतिपादन करेंगी इस सभा में जुड़े हुए जो भी हमारे विद्वत जन है श्रोता जन है कला प्रेमी है श्री अतुल जी दिव्यांश जी रूपेश जी चंद्रकांत जी राका जैन गायत्री जी जवे दोषी कनमल जी और रश्मि भल्ला जी मैं सबका हार्दिक स्वागत करता हूँ इसी तरह से मधुकर जी संदीप जी शिखा जी सुशील कुमार सोनकर जी स्वप्ना भोवाल जी इन सबका मैं हार्दिक स्वागत करता हूँ कि आप लोग इसका लाभ भी ले रहे हैं और हम लोगों का उत्साह भी वर्धन कर रहे हैं जैसा कि पिछले वर्ष मैंने मैंने मैडम का परिचय दिया था और मैं तो कहता हूँ कि जब वो अपना व्याख्यान देती है तो वह परिचय अपने आप हो जाता है उनकी विद्वता का और उनके द्वारा कई वल्यम नाम से जैन पेंटिंग्स की बुक्स भी प्रकाशित है और भी बहुत सी पुस्तकें प्रकाशित हैं उनका भी हम लोग लाभ लेंगे और मैं पुनः डॉक्टर पवन जी का हार्दिक अभिनंदन और स्वागत करता हूँ कि आप अपने द्वितीय व्याख्यान माला से हम लोगों को उत्कृत करें जीतू भाई जी जुड़ने वाले हैं अगर वो जुड़ जाएंगे तो आखिरी में उनके दो शब्द हम लोग सुनने का प्रयास करें जरूर ठीक मैडम जी जी जय जिनेंद्र एवरीबॉडी एंड वी आर गोइंग टू स्टार्ट टुडे वेरी क्विकली yeah so uh, today uh, today's topic as uh, 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 sir has just told us we are going to learn about various uh, jain scriptures uh, or texts in whom we uh, those uh, texts where we find paintings or illustrations both in digambar and shvetambar traditions mind you these are only uh, some examples of the text which i illustrated and as we uh, pro you know progress in this uh, you know the, the chain of lectures probably we will encounter uh, many more texts right so this is just a, a sample i could tell you that these are some of the texts that we are going to look at today so <clears throat> when we talk about jain texts or literature 
religious texts. What is the origin of uh, Jain literature? So I had uh, spoken about it in my last lecture also, as also mentioned in Tri Shashti Shalak Purush, on the attainment of omniscience uh, that Tirthankar delivers Sarman. You know, and we are looking at the Sambhasaran in a uh, Kalpa Sutra painting. On the basis of the sermons, principal disciples or the Gandhars of Tirthankars, uh, they compose scriptural texts in sutra form. And these compositions are known as the Dwadashangi or uh, 12 primary canons or angas. Okay. And earliest uh, scriptural texts uh, were written in Ardhmagdi Prakrit of uh, Shwetamba tradition and uh, Shorseni Prakrit, Prakrit of Madhidesh, scriptural texts of Digamba tradition. Mostly the nomenclature of scriptures is, uh, you know, in different forms like the Shrutas, the Agmas, Siddhantas, uh, the Pravachan, etc. It is a very uh, well-established uh, fact that Jain canons were the first ones uh, to have been written from Shrutas to Smriti or from the oral tradition to into a uh, written form. Okay. And before we look at some of the texts, uh, let's first, uh, you know, devote some time into making of these Jain illustrated uh, manuscripts. And only then we will be able to differentiate, uh, you know, one text from the other and also the timeline when they were executed. So the earlier manuscripts were first written on palm leaf panels. We all know that. And the earliest known illustrated palm leaf manuscript is that of Nishita Churni in the collection of Sangvina Bhandar in Patan. The colophon of this particular manuscript, which is the last folio of the manuscript, it bears the date of 1100 CE and states that the book was written by one Dev Prasad at the Bhrigu Kach, which is modern Bharuch, in the reign of Jaisimha, who ruled Gujarat from... Na uh, 1094 to 1143 C. The language used was Prakrit and the script was Jain Nagari. You can see these holes in the manuscript folios. Huh? So these are called the Granthisthan. And these are mainly for rubrication or they were made in the to the palm leaves with the thread. Here you can see the thread also and were kept, uh, you know, they were tied together and were kept secure in between uh, wooden patlis or the uh, kasht patikas or the covers. And this is the kasht patika that you can see, completed manuscript nicely inserted between richly decorated wooden covers. The manuscript uh, leaves were also sometimes guarded by the patris as they are called or the cardboard covers and which were painted or covered with printed cloth or sometimes also embroidered. Uh, painting in the Western... Uh, Indian style, the Jain paintings, were not flexible to any kind of regional influences at which we will see uh, very soon. And this is one palm leaf folio that I'm trying to show you. There is a Granthisthan in the center here for the perforation of a binding cord. Hmm. And of course, later on, paper became the popular material. The earliest uh, available illustrated paper manuscript is that of Kalp Sutra in the Royal Asiatic Society and a Kalka Chari Katha of the same date in the Ananji Kalyanji, you know, Pedi, uh, you know, in Limdi, dated 1415 CE. It may be inferred from the presence of these sketches here. You can see these sketches that after the writer or the scribe or the calligrapher, uh, you know, uh, he's written the text he leaves a certain space blank. The person painting made these uh, diagrammatic notes for his own guidance while he was going over the work that needed to be done. So the incomplete folio where blank space is left for illustration that you can see here. So looking at this incomplete folio, we can easily make out that the scrib or the calligrapher and the painter or the artist were not the same person. Okay, and the page number also was placed consistently on the reverse to the bottom right 
uh, a fact that uh, many scholars, uh, you know, they get confused in the past and when they write the catalogs, sometimes they get the front and the back mixed up. The artist always adhered to the traditions and conventions of the manuscript painting, which is very important to remember. Now we saw the palm leaf folio. This is a paper folio I'm show showing you. There is a Granthi Sthan, huh? that hole that we saw in the center for the perforation of a binding cord. It is interesting to note that in paper manuscript folio, which we are looking at right now, the folios have these uh, big red circles, two in the margins and one in the center showing the survival of the palm leaf tradition <clears throat> to allow for the Granthi Sthan. Though in, we know paper manuscript folios are not to, you know, tied uh, with a hole in between. Though, I mean, so no such hole is required. So the presence of the string hole in the form of a dot uh, thus survives as a vestigial ornament. And this also shows the, uh, the perpetuation of a convention, a memory of the past practice and the continuation of the sacrosanct uh, format that these uh, manuscripts follow. And any deviation from the set norm was not entertained for the fear of it losing its uh, magical religious character as this was the very essence of the paintings. And this is of course a paper uh, folio of Kalpasutra with gold calligraphy. Uh, the text is written in gold paint on a red background in an elegant Jain Nagri uh, script. Of course, it also is a reminiscent of the royal editions which were produced under the pious Solanki king of Patan, Kumar Pal. And uh, as I had mentioned last time, he had created 21 libraries alone in his uh, capital town of uh, Patan, and probably they were stored there. Okay. So the colors employed in the illustrations of Jain manuscripts were gold, either as gold leaf forming the foundation of the painting or yellow gold uh, pigment, which takes the place of gold as representing the very uh, flesh or the body color. Other colors were black, pure burly white, red, blue, green, and pink. The writing is on each side of the folio and the folio is uh, flipped over horizontally as the text was read like this, it was flipped over. The last page was the colophon, which bears the date of execution along with other details such as patrons, provenance, etc. So it may be, you know, remarked that looking at this painting, uh, Jain paintings exhibit um, marked peculiarities, I would say, in the delineation of the human form. The most, uh, the most conspicuous being those of the three-fourth profile that you see and the uh, in which the further eyes, you know, further protruding, you know, out unnaturally, this is the further eye that I'm talking about, which is, uh, you know, just hanging in the air unnaturally and the long point pointed nose, which is uh, projects beyond the outline of the cheek. Yeah. So these are, uh, we'll talk about some more uh, typical characteristics of the Jain paintings. Uh, angularity, uh, let's look at this painting, the angularity that you see of the features and the projection of the further eye. Here you can see again, all the characters will have this uh, further eye. This is the main characteristic, okay. Broad chest, uh, sometimes it is so exaggerated that a distinction between a male and female is also almost lost. And lion waist, which is attenuated waist, broad shoulders, but the waist is very, very thin. A three quarter profile position in which the further eye pro un, you know, protrudes unnaturally and uh, long pointed nose projects beyond the outline of the cheek. Uh, very, very pictographic, I would say, and minimalist. And more emphasis is given on the narration than the aestheticity of the painting and total disregard to any kind of perspective of, or depth, which actually we en encountered in the later paintings. Yeah, uh, the torturous appearance of the postures, if you can see here, yeah. Uh, the queen, uh, Tirthanka's mother is shown lying down, but her posture is sometimes somehow very, very torturous uh, to, if you look at. The stiff and heavily starched uh, uh, appearance of the garments that we look at here. 
and most importantly, the depiction of highly decorative uh, textiles that we see in the form of costumes, furnishings, here you can see, and tapestry or the bed covers, etc. So textiles depicted uh, exhibit the contemporary trade or the, especially the textile trade that was flourishing in Gujarat and those products were being exported westwards to Central Asia and Egypt and eastwards to um, Indonesia, I would say that. In fact, uh, further eye is the most important characteristic uh, and the tradition of this further eye raises some uh, very basic questions. What was its origin? Was it a pan-Indian phenomenon or regional? Was it particular to Jain paintings? Uh, were the artists untrained? If it was a pan-Indian phenomenon, why did the other traditions, uh, you know, disregard it so quickly? At what stage uh, was it that, uh, you know, was uh, at what stage Jain paintings got influenced by other schools? And uh, yeah, so these are some of the questions. So let, I will quickly tell you what could be, could have been the origin of this uh, uh, further eye and the three-fourth profile. So let us examine the precursors of the typical characteristics of the Jain paintings, especially with reference to the further eye. At Alora, uh, wall painting of the Kalashna temple, 8th century, we are looking at Lakshmi ceiling painting, cave 16. Huh? One side of the face is in profile. You can see while the three-quarter view is maintained on the other side by depicting, uh, you know, uh, for the forehead, eyebrow, and part of the chin with the further eye here. In later paintings, a slight part of the upper cheek, yeah, this one, was still, up, you know, visible, which transformed itself by its absence and as the uh, further eye hanging in the air in illustrated manuscripts of Western India, which means that in later paintings, this particular cheek uh, totally disappeared and you could just find one eye outside known as the further eye. This became the <clears throat> artistic traditions of the time Pan-India and not religion or region specific, the Buddhist Alchi murals in Ladakh, the Balgopal Stuti, the Vasant Vilas manuscripts, etc. are painted in similar fashions. While the other schools uh, like Chaur Panchashika and other over the period discarded the depiction of further eye, Jain paintings uh, stuck to it. This feature eventually became a canon of Western Indian uh, school of painting, which is not surprising because uh, we know that schools' historic preference for linearity and strict adherence also to the canonical injunctions, right? So this was the reason that it was much, much later that uh, Jain paintings were able to shed this uh, further eye. Getting back to where we started about the Jain literature and texts, religious texts, it's very well established that as I said, canons were first ones to have been written from Shutas to Smriti. Uh, council for uh, Vachans or Redaction. Uh, there were four Jain councils that took place, partly Putra Mathura and twice in Vallabhi simultaneously. Under the leadership of they were the Shaman, when most of the Jain canons were written and codified. Yeah. So these are, uh, you know, the Jain texts, the 12 Angas, Upangas, Sutras, etc., the commentaries, uh, Niryuktis, Bhashas, Churnis, uh, mm, Tikas. So these are the different texts that we encounter. The Digambar literature can be traced only to the uh, first millennium, with its oldest surviving sacred text being the mid-second century, Shatkhandagam, huh? scripture in the six parts of Dharsen. One of the most important scholar monk of the Digambar tradition was, of course, Kund Kund Bhar. Yeah. Uh, Digambar Shorseni literature, uh, Kashai Pahadu, originally written by Acharya Gundhar, deals with passion, causes of karma bondage. Commentary on this text is called the Jai Dhavala by Veer Sen, Jin Sen in 10 volumes. The Digambars believe that the words of Mahavir neither survive nor could be recorded. The original teachings went through a rapid period of decline, state the Digambars. Accordingly, their 33rd Acharya was Dharsen, who knew Vananga, and he taught this to Pushpadanta and Bhutbali, 683 years after the Moksha of Mahavir. 
That Anga was also lost with the death of those two. That saints' teachings that have survived are Shatkhandagams and Kashai Pahudu, treaties on the passions, which were written on palm leaves near a cave in Mount Girnar, Gujarat, and a copy of which uh, with a 12th century commentary came to South Karnataka, known as the very famous Dhavala manuscript. Uh, now we are looking at the same very popular Dhaval uh, manuscript from the Karnataka Mudbidri region. And this is, of course, a uh, so Dhavla uh, original manuscript, this of course we are looking at the copy of the illustrated manuscript. This is an Dhaval uh, is an exhaustive commentary on Shatkhandagam by Acharya Veer Sen in 16 volumes in 72,000 shlokas. And this is known as, of course, uh, this is written in 9th century that I just uh, mentioned. The commentaries are in Prakrit alternated with Sanskrit. And this is a folio from the illustrated copy. Uh, this has survived as the Mudbidri manuscript, the very famous, which were used by regional Jains, not for reading and study, but as an object of devotional worship for centuries. It is only very late in 19th century, the fragile and decaying manuscript was copied and portions of it leaked to scholars between um, in the... Uh, towards the end of 19th and beginning of uh, 20th century, uh, despite objections of Digambar monks. It is considered to be the oldest known Digambar text, ultimately traceable to the uh, second uh, century. This is another palm leaf uh, uh, folio from the same manuscript from Mudbidri. Uh, is one, yeah. So here we can see uh, Bahubali and, uh, you know, he's flanked by his two sisters, Brahmi and Sundari. They were wearing kakshat style dhotis which covered their breasts and are then taken over the left shoulders and cover their heads. They are shown without any upper garment. Uh, such was the you know custom at that time. The headdress and the ornaments point to the South Indian influence. They are shown removing the vegetative growth that has entangled Bahubali's legs. In this context, uh, they can also be identified as the two Vidyadharis uh, which the the Gambars believe in. <clears throat> uh, Agamas, we know, are divided into pur uh, Purvas, Angas, Angbahyas. And one of the Angbahyas are the Ched Sutras, uh, six in number, on the uh, monastic conduct and behavior of the ascetics. The Ched Sutras are a book of discipline for monks. These are six texts of which there have been written. Three have been uh, uh, believed to be written by Bhadrabahu in uh, circa 300 BC. Uh, Acharyadash or Dashrut Skandha, the eighth chapter is known as the Paryushan Kalp, which along with the biography of the Jinnas and Jain genealogy uh, gives the details of the conduct of the sadhus in Sadhu Samachari. This is also known as, popularly known as Kalp Sutra, which is being recited in many temples during Paryushan and celebrated at Samvatsari. Okay. So this is a typical folio I'm showing from Kalp Sutra. And it is the text most prolifically illustrated amongst the Shvetambar Jains. We find uh, uh, maximum uh, illustrated copies of this text. Uh, mostly in prose, it has been divided into 291 uh, sutras and paragraphs, or paragraphs rather. It has uh, three distinct sections that I just spoke about, the Jincharits, Thavirvali, and Sadhu Samachari. Uh, which talks about the, you know, life uh, stories of the Jinnas, the gen genealogy and the, uh, the conduct about the uh, monks, how they should be, uh, you know, during, especially during the rainy season. So attention is focused on what have been called as, as the uh, Panch Kalyanak or the five uh, prime events in the lives of the Tirthankars, Garb, Janma, Diksha, and uh, uh, Garb, Janma, Diksha, Gyan, and Moksha. These are the uh, five. Uh, names of the chief family members of these Tirthankars are also given. Life of Mahavir is given in great detail. And also the episode of transfer of embryo, which I spoke about uh, in my last lecture, is also given. Some episodes of Parsh, Arishnemi, and Rishabh are also described in Brihat Kalp Sutra. 
Uh, the author of the Kalp Sutra says that the events in the lives of remaining 20 should be taken as being exactly same as those described in the case of Mahavir, except for the um, incidence of the transfer of embryo. <clears throat> uh, this is a Kalkacharya manuscript folio, a non-canonical text appendix to Kalp Sutra describing the story of Kalkacharya, whose sister, here you can see Kalkacharya, whose sister is abducted by the king of Ujjain, Gardbil. Here Kalka is being presented uh, to the Shahi king and Kalka unfolds the plan to defeat king Gardbil by, for rescuing his sister and promises to hand over the throne of Ujjaini to the Shahi king. So the physiognomy, the facial features of the these Shahi soldiers and courtiers are, uh, you know, you can see they are very mongoloid as they are, you know, they are situated across the Indus. And you can see he's wearing a indigo color, uh, blue takla, but it's called this outer coat, mid-calf length with short sleeves here. Yeah, four-pointed collar, which is, you know, also known as the cloud collar here and deco with decoration at the neckline. He's also sporting a Taj cooler on top, you can see on his head. And uh, his long hair, there you can see they are braided and uh, tasseled at the end. He has a very thin mustache and pointed beard. He's also wearing kuf. These are called the kufs, no? which are mid-calf or knee-length boots with upturned pointed toes. The, you can look at the eyes here, the sidelong glances of these, no? all the shy soldiers, courtiers. Uh, these are, you know, typical, only reserved for them. The uh, further eye actually is, uh, Kalka is shown with further eye. Okay, here you can see. It is only, you know, for the Kalka, the Jain character in this uh, whole painting, uh, true to the style of Jain painting style that you can see the pointed nose and the further eye. Okay. Then we come to some more. We I showed you the slide where we I showed Mool Sutras are four in number. Uh, they describe the fundamental ascetic rules, and Ogha Niryukti or Pinda Niryukti and Uttar Adhyan Sutra are two such uh, Mool Sutras which are uh, uh, often illustrated. We find so, okay. So here we are looking at uh, Ogha Niryukti describes right food for ascetics to be accepted as alms or yeah, biksha. So two folios we are looking at. Uh, this is the one with Kamdev uh, here, Shri, and two uh, one elephant here, and this is the colophon page. Palm leaf, and it is a dated manuscript, uh, 1060. Huh? Uh, and Western Indian style again. So of the illustrated manuscripts of this period, the earliest is dated this 1060. One of the folios contains a lively depiction, uh, representation of Goddess Sri and God Kamdev here, executed in very, very taut, expressive uh, lines symbolizing inner energy. On the side panel of the same folio, you can see an elephant here and two elephants on the other uh, folio. Right, the uh, depiction of these elephants, uh, they are these rounded bodies suggest weight and volume. In terms of style, uh, the inner grace of Kamdev here contrasts with the plastic rendition. When I say plastic, which means uh, the rotundity, the volume, huh? rendition of the elephants. So both are examples of two different uh, schools of art or idioms, the origin of which interestingly lie in the ancient traditions of uh, wall paintings, uh, that of uh, Ajanta Alora. The portrayal of the elephant here you can see, I'm showing you the detail. It almost matches with the, uh, you know, the wall, the ceiling painting of this elephant, right? Which characterized the 5th century Ajanta painting. While uh, Kamdev here, if you see, it uh, is very much closer to the uh, painting that we get from 8th century Elora painting. So throughout this period, uh, the stylic, uh, the style, the style, stylistic, expression kind of oscillated between these two styles, that of uh, Ajanta and Alora. And then later on, of course, the Jain paintings or the Western Indian paintings slowly developed a style of 
uh, their own. So uh, the next Mool Sutra, of course, I spoke about Uttarathyan Sutra. It's a Jain text of uh, fourth century. Uh, is one of the most important sacred books of Shvetambar Jains who venerate its an antiquity and authority. The main text is written in Ardhmagdi Prakrit, accompanied by a Sanskrit commentary in uh, smaller Nagri characters. The Uttaradhyan Sutra, one of the four Mool Sutras of the Jain uh, canon, is a work in 36 chapters, each sermon on aspects of Jain doctrine and uh, discipline. It illustrates some of the most important uh, rituals also of the Jain religion. It is believed by Orthodox Jains to contain the actual words of Mahavir and are considered to be last teachings of Mahavir. The text is interspersed with uh, lively narratives from folk literature to keep the reader's attention. And it is uh, by these stories that the miniatures are inspired. It is concerned with the rules of behavior that govern uh, monastic life. We'll see some more folios uh, from Uttar Adhyan Sutra. This folio illustrates the uh, monk to attain perfect chastity and this end, to this end, must avoid the attraction of women. So here you can see clad in white, diaphanous robe, two beautiful young girls uh, dressed in rich garments and jewels attempt to engage his attention. At the bottom, you can see female musicians and dancers add to the distraction. The monk is, uh, you know, depicted frontally with the mm, cool passivity of a sculpture while the women are enlivened by the combination of three-fourths profile, the feet are, of course, in full profile, which kind of, uh, it's imparting a lot of uh, movement to it. And more so, the fluttering ends of the orni, the, uh, no, the hair, the braided in a plait, is also, uh, you know, making the whole uh, scene look very, very animated. Another, uh, you know, uh, story of uh, Jai Ghosh here. Uh, I'm not going to get into the detail here. And uh, yeah. <clears throat> then the next text that we will talk about, Adi Puran, is an important uh, Sanskrit text of Digambar Jains. It records the lives of all the 63 great men, uh, you know, the which are also recorded in the famous, uh, you know, Hem Chandra Charya's uh, work. So it was begun during the reign of uh, Rashkuta king, Amogvarsh I, and by Jin Sen, who was a monk and scholar around the 9th century C, and completed by one of his students, Gunbhadra, whose edition bears the separate name of Uttar Puran. Jin Sen was the disciple of Acharya Veer Sen. I spoke about Veer Sen just now when we were talking about the uh, Dhaval uh -huh, manuscript, the uh, commentary on the uh, Shat Khandagam. It's the same Acharya Virsen and uh, so Jinsen was his disciple and he completed the commentary uh, of course I have already mentioned that. Later Acharya Pushpadant in the 10th century wrote this Mahakavya text in Arth, uh, you know, up branch language in Jain Nagdi script. So this is the illustrated manuscript, uh, a copy of that particular up branch, uh, you know, um, uh, manuscript. So just as how we have Ramayana written by Balmiki in Sanskrit and then later Tulsidas wrote it in a more uh, popular lo local language, Avdi. So this is something very similar and you will find uh, many uh, such uh, texts written uh, in, you know, earlier in Prakrit or then later in, uh, uh, you know, local language or Abdhansh. So, uh, yeah, Ch Charit Anuyog, Jain text in which life stories and uh, what is to be learned from these life stories are described. And it was written by Gun Vijayji in 1668. And this was a Sanskrit prose. And Neminath Charit text in, you know, is part of this. In this particular text, uh, besides Neminath, the 22nd Tirthankar, the lives of Balram, Vasudev, Kans, uh, Jarasandh, um, Rukmani, Satyabhama, Rajmati, huh? all these are also described. So by now you must have uh, realized that there is a lot of assimilation of 
uh, Brahmanic or Hindu deities also in the Jain pantheon, which I spoke about in my last lecture. So Nemina Charit in Shantinath Bhandar, Kambay, this is a dated manuscript, uh, 1241 CE. Uh, okay, there are illustrations of Tirthankar Nemina, Goddess Ambika, etc. Here, of course, we are looking at a, a donor couple probably is listening to his teacher seated on a, a couch with folded hands and seated. Uh, of course, the Shravika is also in the same posture. The drawing is very, very carefully drawn and there is an attempt to model colors. When I say model colors, you can see this slight shading around the contours, which kind of uh, imparts some kind of plasticity or modeling. Okay. Then we talk about the Mahavir Charit. So, three Shashti Shalak Purush Charit, lives of 63 best men. Again, I keep coming back to this. Uh, ranks as Mahakavya among the Jains and is divided into uh, 10 Parvas. And the last Parva, Mahavir Charit, uh, it deals with the life of Mahavir. And also appendix to this book, Parishisht Parvan and Sthavir uh, Bali Charit is the biography of the earliest teachers of Jainism, whose names and the order of succession may be uh, regarded as uh, historical. So here you can see um, uh, a guru and a shishya here. When you hold this, you know, the cloth patika in your hand, it clearly shows the there is a discourse uh, which is going on and probably they are talking with each other. And the sthapna charya here, I spoke about in my last lecture, which of course is uh, here, this one, which is always present, uh, again denoting the same thing. The next text is uh, Shantinath Charit. Uh, is a Sanskrit text that describes the life of 16th Jain uh, Tirthankar. There is a manuscript of this text, uh, which was written in 1397, uh, which was, uh, of course, the copy of which was then later um, given to LD Institute. And these are some of the, there are set of wooden patlis, which also depict the life of, earlier lives of uh, Shantinath. These wooden covers are also, again, from LD Institute. And they are dated huh, 1260 CE. Uh, the 16th Tirthankar, whose uh, you know cognizance or lakshan is symbol uh, is dear, uh, which is a symbol of peace, uh, had 12 earlier uh, births before he attained Kevalgyan. They are these are also called bhavas. So one of the earlier births, he was born as King Sri Vijay, and his uh, queen was uh, Queen Sutara. So almost on the line of, um, you know, Rama and you can see a similar story unfolding. Here you can see uh, there is a golden deer and King Sri Vijay is pursuing the deer. And here there is a Ashni Ghosh, a Vidyadhar, you know, evil, uh, 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 who is trying to abduct uh, Sutara. And here he, you can see him, you know, flying in this uh, kind of a, uh, a chariot. And uh, here you can see Sutara in the flames here. But you see the Ramayan magic ended at uh, by creating this golden deer. But in this particular story, this is a copy of Sutara, which is, you know, shown to Sri Vijay so that, uh, you know, he feels that she's dying in the, uh, uh, you know, in this fire and he also jumps into the fire. And then it is only later when two people come and, you know, dows of the fire and the uh, kind of rescue the king. Yeah. And similarly, the, this is the eventually battle that ensued between uh, King Sri Vijay and Ashani Ghoshya. Just very, very similar to the Ramayana episode that we have here. So many of the episodes that we encounter in uh, Jain uh, literature and in uh, manuscripts, uh, illustrations also, Sometimes uh, they draw from each other. I cannot say that who is, uh, you know, uh, influencing whom, right? But there are a lot of uh, similarities and overlaps we will find. So Ubdesh Mala, this is a folio. Uh, but this is from Bijapur, Karnataka. Huh? This is a very old Jain didactic text. Uh, contains uh, uh, 541 gathas and was composed by Dharmdas Gani. Okay. Uh, it is unknown as to when he lived, but uh, uh, 
several commentators have regarded him as one of the pupils of Mahavir himself. However, because of the form of Prakrit language used in the text and the uh, fact that the text has uh, mentions of later monks also like the Acharya Arya Vajra, uh, the text seems to have been composed between the 5th and 6th century CE. Whatever it is, its age may be, it is quite certain that the text was held in very, very high esteem for a long time by Shvetambar sect. Uh, several texts were comp composed after the model of the original and several commentaries on it prove uh, beyond doubt the popularity of this particular text. Okay. Uh, there are many, you know, teachings, the text not only because it became popular, but possibly began to be illustrated as well because of its uh, popularity. Here you can see Parshanath seated with seven hooded uh, snake canopy and his snake uh, cognizance is the, also there uh, at the bottom. Uh, here you can see the um, uh, Padmavati and uh, Dharnendra here on two sides, uh, holding two chauris in their hands. Uh, typical costumes of South India, you can see uh, frontal pleating, gold, uh, you know, um, gold borders in their dhotis, uh, pearl. Uh, mm, mm, uh, pearl ornaments that they are wearing here. Uh, Padmavati is standing on this uh, kukut, her vahan, and uh, dharnendra on the elephant here. So, of course, uh, the entire, uh, you know, the persona of these two are showing that uh, they're displaying, uh, you know, their wealthy character. Uh, also, sometimes uh, when you have these <clears throat> uh, two characters on the sides of the Tirthankar, Sometimes they also uh, refer to the uh, donor couples also in, uh, you know, many a times. So this is a folio from uh, the same manuscript. This is the colophon folio. Uh, of course, you can recognize Shantinath by the, uh, with the presence of deer at the bottom. Only the color of Shantinath is a little bit of, uh, you know, in contrast. And it is a colophon page which tells us about the date 1678 CE, city of Bijapur. And actually it was a uh, Shwetambar donor who actually commissioned this, uh, which is very, very rare because mostly in the region of Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, uh, some parts of Purisa also, most of the time we will find uh, Digambar, uh, you know, sect more... Um, uh, dominant in these areas, right? <clears throat> so here, probably this is that donor couple that I was talking about, almost styled in a similar fashion that we saw in the uh, earlier folio of Padmavati and Dharnendra. This is uh, Updesh Mala, a scene from the life of Vasudeva and Samudra Vijaya. Uh, yeah, uh, let's not... Uh, so I, I only want you to... I'm not going to tell you the entire story. What I want you to uh, focus here is the uh, the the uh, the rendering of the painting, how it is done. See, look at the noses, the eyes, the costumes. Huh? They can it can easily be passed as the as a Mughal painting. So the angularity, the further eye, the stiff garments, the tortuous uh, postures, the three fourth profile, all that. Most of it has just disappeared because we are looking at complete profile here, you know, and the costumes are totally, uh, you know, these are all uh, Mughal costumes that we are looking at, the Atpati turban from Mughal period. And also, the uh, as I told you, that this is a <clears throat> uh, 17th century manuscript, right? So much, much later when uh, we uh, the artists were already exposed to the uh, Mughal uh, paintings, etc. Right. So these are some of the uh, some of the changes that we will encounter as we uh, see some more manuscripts. Yeah. So Yashodhar Charit. This is a very popular uh, manuscript amongst the Digambars. Uh, this is one of the Dharmkathas, and its format is uh, that of a story within a story, wherein the life of King Yashodhar is unveiled. Right. Uh, the main tenet of the um, story is non-violence and uh, through these stories, uh, the, uh, you know, the 
laity or the commoners, they are reminded of the main teachings of the Jain religion. And through this, uh, this is non-canonical text. Okay, you don't, this is not one of the canons that we were talking about, the Yanga, Angas, Upangas, etc. And it is also called just uh, Charihu right? in the local language in Upper Brunsha. This text is uh, mainly preferred by the Gambars. Yeah, I have already spoken. And uh, most of the illustrations are also done in the Gambar uh, fashion. So here the story starts with King Maridat, who is seated in the center here yeah? uh, in Rajpur, receives a Kapalik who claims that the king can uh, you know, move in the air uh, if he offers sacrifices of a male and a female of every living species uh, to the goddess uh, Chandramani here. Yeah. This is the goddess here. Yeah. So two monks, but you're looking at here, the brother and sister here, yeah, very, very young, uh, were brought to the temple by uh, the soldiers. And the of course, the monk gave a discourse to the king Maridat and of course he was very impressed by his speech and asked him as to uh, why uh, why uh, did she uh, why did he at such a tender age he became a monk so the monk of course uh, whose name was Abhai, Abhai Ruch huh, uh, then recounted the story of uh, king Yashodhar okay so this is how the whole thing starts and then of course there are different stories and uh, about uh, King Yashodar and his previous lives or uh, next births, etc. So here he appeared as a snake and uh, Chandramati, his uh, uh, mother, as a porcupine. Both met their deaths in the forest when the porcupine, of course, killed the snake. Here you can see the snake and the porcupine. And of course, uh, the uh, snake also was in turn killed by large animal. This is another very famous uh, story. King uh, Yashomati, the son of uh, Yashoda, in the course of his royal duties, uh, proceeded for a hunting expedition. Yeah. And on his way to the forest, he passed a Jain monk named Sudat. Yeah, you can see it's, uh, the Jain monk. The king actually could not get any hunt that day. Huh? And he was returning absolutely empty-handed. And that evening, when he again encountered a monk Sudat, on seeing him, uh, he concluded that the monk had been, uh, you know, very inauspicious, or he brought ill omen, and which actually uh, must have prevented him from making any kill that day. So, in fury, he kind of set his dogs on the monk, which you can see in this particular uh, folio here. But when they came near the, you know, near the monk, they just stood still with their heads uh, kind of uh, bent. That is the story, right? So this is what is shown here. It's a uh, dated manuscript, 1596. So uh, uh, it's almost end of the 16th century where uh, we already know there was uh, there were a lot of other influences that were working. And again, you can see here the uh, the garments of the soldiers here, the king, yeah, they are wearing jamas, pajamas, the turbans are there. There is no further eye here, right? <clears throat> okay. Then next one is the Bhaktamba Stotra, most famous Stotra in Jain community. It has 48 verses written in Sanskrit by Acharya uh, Manatunga in the 7th century CE. Okay, he was put under, we all know the story, he was put under arrest in 48 chambers under locks and chains by King Bhoj in the city of Ujjain. And in this prison, of course, he uh, entered the realms of Lord Rishabnath and he started the prayer. He wrote a poem known as this, Bhaktamba Stotra. And uh, of course, uh, flowing with the unbounded energy, he started praying. And there was a chain reaction due to this effect of Bhaktamba Stotra. It is said that Acharya Manatunga was uh, no more, rem uh, he was no more imprisoned. He remained, uh, yeah, as the locks opened automatically. Okay, widely illustrated in paintings. And uh, this is, of course, in the uh, Sanganir area, this particular painting is, yeah. And of course, the, the verses of Bhaktamba Srotra are supposed to have magical properties. 
and there are many temples. Uh, in fact, there's a temple in Bharuj with a section which is dedicated to the Bhattambar and its author, Manatunga. And also there are, uh, you know, some places where the entire Bhaktambar Srotra is uh, written in a temple. Yeah. Okay. This is another folio uh, from a copy of uh, same Uttar uh, Bhaktambar Srotra only. This is again a dated one, 1773. Uh, uh, in Jaipur it is. Uh, you can see three figures show typical costumes of the Mughal period. The marble architecture that you see has local influence of Rajasthan and the niches in the wall here. You can see these niches here. Jinko hum ala bolte in a local language mein. These are again, uh, you know, show Mughal influence. The interior and exterior uh, spaces are divided by, you know, separated by these uh, curtains. Uh, the figures show contemporary costumes and textiles of that time. The further eye is totally missing. The painting is done in the popular Mughal style here. The borders of the painting are also, uh, you know, decorated with the different variegated flowers, uh, which again, you know, harks back to the Mughal folios, you know, the hashiyas in the Mughal folios that we encounter in uh, Mughal miniatures. This is another painting, Indra carrying the Tirthankar on Arava towards the Pandushila for illustration. Hmm. Also, the dresses of the men here, jamas, pajamas, uh, patkas that you can clearly see. Yeah. This is another one on the Pandushila. Indra and other gods are performing the Abhishek with milk and other ongoings. Right. So this is these are the different ones. And lastly, we'll talk about uh, some Grahani Sutra is a Shvetambar text on Jain cosmology. The uh, different features, the Adhai Dvipa, the Lok Purush, and different uh, realms are described in this. This is, again, a, a dated manuscript, yeah, 1637 CE. A large number of these illustrated manuscripts of, uh, are available in Jain Bhandars and private collections. Uh, because of the nature of the text, most of the pictures are of uh, uh, cosmographical charts of the universe with its, uh, you know, different uh, continents, oceans, which do not have uh, much aesthetic appeal as works of art. But at the same time, uh, every illustrated manuscript of the Sangrani Sutra also contains some illustrations of different classes of gods, uh, their distinguishing symbols, uh, the illustrations of the Jain Leshyas, you know, the thought colors, uh, the 14 jewels of the Chakravartins, uh, scenes of heaven and hells, which actually make these uh, manuscripts you know, very, very uh, interesting. So with this, I'm going to conclude today's uh, lecture. I've just given you some glimpses of the various texts. It doesn't mean, as I had mentioned earlier, that... Uh, these are the only texts which I illustrated. No, there are many, many more and which we will encounter as we progress. And say, for instance, Sangrani Sutra, I've just shown you one folio. We will, you know, dedicate an entire chapter, you know, lecture on Sangrani Sutra, Kalp Sutra, uh, then Kalkacharya, Adi Puran, etc., etc. Okay, so uh, don't worry. Don't think that I'm, I've just shown you one folio of Kalp Sutra and that's it. We are going to study all these uh, manuscripts uh, in great detail later. Thank you very much. Yeah. With this, I'm going to uh, stop. Yeah. Thank you. Jajanin sir. Ji to bhai ji meri. Ji ji sir. Jajanin to bhai ji. Ji ji namaskar namaskar. Kaun ji aap kaise ho? Badiya sir. Thank you. Thank you. Aapka pura pravartan suna bahut hi achcha laga apne chain chitra kala par. Bahut hi saar garbi taur pura जब से चित्रकला का प्रारंभ हुआ तब से लेकर के अध्यावधि 
किस तरह से जैन चित्रकला का विकास होता गया जैन चित्रकला अपने आप में एक विशेष महत्वपूर्ण चित्र शैली है और उसकी विशेषताओं का वर्णन भी आपने अलग अलग सदियों में अलग अलग ग्रंथों में किस तरह से दर्शाया गया है उसका भी आपने यहाँ विचार किया प्रदर्श प्रदर्शित किया सबसे सर आपकी ध्वनि नहीं सुनाई दे रही है I think he has frozen. No, the yes. the internet might not be right. Jitu bhai ki unmute karein. Ah. Internet ka kuch samasya lag raha hai Jitu bhai ke saath mein. Haan ji. Ji ji. अब आप पहले अब अब आ रही है जी 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 अभी नहीं आ रही आवाज अभी भी नहीं आ आ रही अब आ रही ओके हाँ मैं फिर से बोलता हूँ इसे मेरे ख्याल से आ रही है अब आवाज आ रही है जी सर ओके सही मैं आज के प्रवचन के लिए पवन कुमार जी को पवन जी को बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद देता हूँ पवन जी ने तारपत्रीय पांडुलिपियों में जब से चित्रकला का प्रारंभ हुआ तब से लेकर के इस तरह से चित्र जैन चित्र शैली का विकास होता गया और पेपर मैन्यूस्क्रिप्ट में वो चित्रकला किस तरह से दर्शाई गई है उसका भी यहाँ विवेचन किया जो सबसे बड़ी महत्वपूर्ण बात है कि पेपर मैन्यूस्क्रिप्ट पेपर जब से सुलभ होने लगा और तारपत्रीय ग्रंथों में से जैन ग्रंथकारों ने पेपर को ही चुना और उसके अंदर चित्रकला किस तरह से दास की ओर आगे बढ़ती रही उसका विवेचन किया है अनेक ग्रंथों में जो बहुत ही दुर्लभ ऐसे चित्र मैं जानता हूं पवन जी खुद अलग अलग जगह पर गई है वहां जाकर के खुद उनके फोटोग्राफी की है आज आपने देखा होगा कि पाटन और अन्य शहरों में जैन भंडारों में जैन पांडुलिपि संग्रहों में जाकर के वहां के चित्रों को उन्होंने देखा उनका परीक्षण किया और आज इस प्रवचन में अनेक चित्रों का दर्शन कराया जो सामान्य रूप से दुर्लभ होता है हम जब जाते हैं तो हमारे लिए भी दुर्लभ होता है कि हम पांडुलिपि संग्रहकारों को जब कहते हैं तो कई बार कहते हैं कि चाबी नहीं है कई बार कहते हैं कि अभी आज संभव नहीं है आपको फिर से आना पड़ेगा ये बहुत सारी समस्याएं हैं उन समस्याओं के बीच भी पवन जी ने जो काम किया है उसके लिए मैं बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद देता हूं अभी तो अभी तो ये दूसरा प्रवचन है आगे चल करके अनेक प्रवचन जैन चित्रकला के बारे में हमें जो अनेक नई नई बातें बताएंगे वो हमारे लिए एक ज्ञान वर्धक होगा और साथ ही साथ 
जैनियों की जो चित्रकला रुचि है जैन चित्रकारों ने जिस प्रकार से पांडुलिपियों में छोटी जगह में प्रसंगों को दर्शाया है वो अपने आप में अद्भुत है विशेष रूप से मैं ये कहूं कि आज उन्होंने पवन जी ने कई ग्रंथों का उल्लेख किया कल्प सूत्र के चित्र संग्रहणी के सूत्र और चरित्र काव्यों के अंदर दर्शाए गए चित्र सिद्धांत ग्रंथों में बनाए गए चित्र जिस तरह से आज यहाँ उसका हमें थोड़ा सा परिचय कराया उत्तराध्यन सूत्र है शांतिनाथ चरित्र महाकाव्य है आ, मैं आपको एक और यहाँ इंफॉर्मेशन देना चाहता हूँ कि करीब 2013 में जब एनएमएम नेशनल मिशन फॉर मिनिस्ट्रिप के द्वारा भारतीय चित्रकलाओं पर अलग अलग सेमिनार आयोजित किए गए तब हमने एल डी इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ इंडोलॉजी में से दो सचित्र पांडुलिपियों के बारे में बात की थी एक उत्तराध्यन सूत्र के चित्र और दूसरा शांतिनाथ चरित्र का चरित्र के चित्र दोनों अद्भुत चित्र हैं दोनों ग्रंथों में जो चित्र बताए गए वो अद्भुत है और एन एम एम के द्वारा भारतीय चित्रकला के श्रेष्ठ चित्र के रूप में दोनों पांडुलिपियों के चित्र को अवॉर्ड मिला उसके बाद उसमें से शांतिनाथ चरित्र का चयन किया गया यूनेस्को में भेजा गया वहां उसको हेरिटेज के रूप में अवॉर्ड मिला शांतिनाथ चरित्र में सोलहवे जैन धर्म के सोलहवे तीर्थंकर शांतिनाथ के जीवन चरित्र पर बात कही गई है बहुत कम ही चित्र है उसमें करीब सात या आठ चित्र है लेकिन वह चित्र चित्रकला का जब से पांडुलिपियों में प्रारंभ हुआ उस प्रकार कागज की पोथियों में जब चित्रकला का प्रारंभ हुआ उस समय की ये प्रति है कहने का मतलब ये है कि जैन पांडुलिपियों में जो चित्रकला हमें देखने को मिलती है वो अद्भुत है और छोटी सी जगह में बहुत अद्भुत चित्र बनाए हैं रंगों का चयन वो भी अद्भुत है चित्र को बनाने की जो शैली है वो अद्भुत है आज हमें जो दो चार बातें पवन जी ने बताई वो रिमार्केबल है कि जैन चित्रकला के चित्रों में आंख जिस तरह से मुफिली होती है नाक एक विशेष प्रकार का है दृष्टि जो बताई गई है वो एक अद्भुत रूप से प्रदर्शित की गई है और कॉस्ट्यूम वस्त्र परिधान वो भी अपने आप में अद्भुत है ये सारी बातें पवन जी ने एक घंटे के इस प्रवचन में हमें दर्शाया है और भी आगे अलग अलग ग्रंथों में जो चित्र प्राप्त होते हैं उसके बारे में हमें बताएंगे मैं आज पवन जी का बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद प्रदर्शित करता हूं और आने वाले समय में हमें और भी नई बातें नई चित्र और जैन चित्रकला के विषय में जैसे अभी तो केवल ग्रंथों के चित्र के बारे में कहा है बाद में वस्त्र पर आएंगे और तीर्थों के चित्र के बारे में बात करेंगे और भी अन्य चित्रों के बारे में बात करेंगे आ, मैं पुनः पुनः धन्यवाद देते हुए आप सभी को भी धन्यवाद देता हूँ आज इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ इंडोलॉजी के द्वारा प्रति वर्ष एक कला पर इस प्रकार का आयोजन किया जाता है व्याख्यान श्रेणी का आयोजन होता है पवन जी की ये तीसरी श्रेणी है और तीनों श्रेणिया बहुत ही सफल रही है और हमारे लिए भी गौरव का विषय है कि पवन जी के द्वारा हर साल इस प्रकार के आयोजन होता रहता है डी इंस्टीट्यूट के द्वारा आयोजन होता है 
आप इस आयोजन में सहभागी होते हैं इसलिए आप सबको भी मैं धन्यवाद देता हूं मैं माइक हमारे निदेशक प्रोफेसर विजय कुमार जैन जी को सौंपता हूँ मैं आदरणीय जीतू भाई जी के प्रति भी कृतज्ञता ज्ञापित करता हूँ कि आपने और सूचनाएं दे करके हम सबका ज्ञान वृद्धि की जैसा कि हम लोग नहीं जानते थे कि यूनेस्को के हेरिटेज में हमारे शांतिनाथ स्तवन की जो चित्र है उसको सम्मानित किया गया है तो इस तरह की श्रृंखला में हम लोग और ज्ञान प्राप्त करते जाएंगे आज हमको कोई प्रश्न नहीं दिखाई दे रहे हैं तो मैं समझता हूँ बात नहीं करेंगे जीतू भाई आज मैडम ने जैसा कि संकल्पना की थी कि बहुत से ग्रंथों के आधार पर जैसे भक्तम्बर स्तोत्र को भी कवर किया और देश मरादी पुराण उत्तराध्यन सूत्र तो इस तरह से अगला जो हमारा एपिसोड होगा जो श्रृंखला होगी वो फॉर्म लीफ मैनुस्क्रिप्ट पर होगी तो मैं अभी सभी श्रोताओं को बताना चाहता हूँ कि बहुत ही महत्वपूर्ण श्रृंखला होगी प्रारंभ में आपने मैनुस्क्रिप्ट का जो परंपरा है उसका जो सूक्ष्म ज्ञान है उस पर भी ज्ञान प्राप्त कराया हमको तो मैं अभी सभी श्रोताओं के प्रति जीतू भाई के प्रति पवन जी मैडम के प्रति और सभी श्रोताओं के प्रति जो इसमें जुड़े हुए हैं योगेश शाह जी लक्ष्मीकांत जी हेमा जी गायत्री जी जामिया मिलिया से श्री सुशील कुमार जी इस तरह से बाद अतुल जी सभी के प्रति मैं कृतज्ञता ज्ञापित करता हूँ कि इस तरह से आप लोग ज्ञान का लाभ भी लें और हम लोगों के कार्यक्रम का उत्साह बढ़ाते हुए सफल बनाएं इन्हीं शब्दों के साथ अंगला जो हमारा तीस तारीख को व्याख्यान होगा उसका विषय होगा पाम लीफ मैन सभी को बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद और अभिनंदन जय 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 जय